form is already otherwise supplied to the body as this is also the case for many vitamins, trace elements, and minerals because today's foods, even fruits and vegetables that become more and more over cultivated, contain less and less of these substances the earth person should take this separately or add this to his normal diet as a food supplement. Billy says also for this answer, I thank you, and it will certainly help so many people. By the way, various people have also asked me about how healthy milk actually is. So I can now give them a useful answer, naturally pointing out that you've explained everything to me more exactly. But now, still a question about the prophecy of Henoch you said that if it should actually come to World War III, then Switzerland also won't remain spared anymore, namely for the reason that connections will be entered into with the UN, that is the United Nations, as well as with NATO and with the European Union. How, then, should these connections look loose or firm? What is decisive in this regard? Quetzal says the importance doesn't lie in a loose or free connection but only in the fact that any mutual connection exists at all, whatever this may look like. In every form, Switzerland loses the actual status of its neutrality, which it could only preserve if it in no way entered into any mutual or one-sided connections with binding contracts with the aforementioned organizations. Only through this would actual neutrality be preserved in truth through which an attack on Switzerland would remain undone. But this won't be the case with great certainty, for already shortly after the turn of the millennium, through the irrationality of many Swiss citizens, misled by those who are irresponsible, a firm entry into the UN will take place, which will count as the beginning of the prospective catastrophe, if the prophecy of Henoch should fulfill itself which can still be averted, however, if this people takes the initiative and brings the responsible persons of the government to reason. But this would have to mean that the majority of the population and the rulers become filled with actual reason and responsibility and act accordingly. To open themselves to the world, and this means not opening themselves to a nation and its people, to go into the clutches of some foreign conditioned organizations, etc. and to forfeit their freedom and neutrality thereby, these are truly worth a lot more than the empty promises and lies of those who only strive for power and wealth and to whom all infamous means are right, in order to deceive the people and rule over them. Unfortunately, like with other peoples of other nations, this will also be the case with the Swiss people, at least just with the majority of them who will be shouting for the accessions or other connections to the aforementioned organizations, by what means it will first be recognized too late, as to what the actual truth will be, in regards to the connections and agreements with the ER, NATO, and UN. But once this realization comes, it will be very well too late to be able to slip out again through a suitable mesh. Therefore, it is only to be wished and hoped, and indeed, against all the gloomy prophecies, that the people, even those of Switzerland, will still become reasonable and prevent the impending disaster, which still, for a certain time, actually lies in the realm of possibility, consequently, the prophetic threatening events don't have to arrive and don't have to fulfill themselves. And indeed, it is to be desired that the future will change for the better in the third millennium and that the great time and the century of wars and strife among the earth people will finally be over. In order to achieve this, the earth people just need a little reason, understanding, and love, as well as the will to live together in peace with all humans, to respect and honor one another, and to help one another live. Billy says your word in the human beings here. Actually it would be nice if in this so beautiful world, love and peace would finally prosper among all human beings. But it would probably still be too premature to cherish desires and hopes for this, so I think, because the overall thinking and behavior of the earth person is still too focused on power, materialism, religion, and faith, as well as on selfishness, egotism, pride, self-glorification, jealousy, hatred vindictiveness, racism, and on many other bad things and negative values, then that he could be taught to the better and would also consciously and willingly change for the better. And even then, when the greatest misery and greatest catastrophe falls upon him, 
the person of the earth, he will only reflect upon the better for a short time, and to be sure, only for so long until his agonies and his memories slowly fade away and he thinks that he has the upper hand again. Once he suffers agonies, fear, distress, and misery, then he is ready to make all possible and impossible promises, to pray to every imaginary god with endless words of gratitude and many sacrifices, which he would offer if he would just be released from his shit again. And once it is actually the case that the fear, need, misery, agony, trouble, and danger, etc. are over, then all the promises are forgotten and vanish like sound and smoke, after which the old lifestyle continues, and all harm and evil, all hatred, all unkindness and jealousy, racial hatred, and other forms of hatred as well as vindictiveness and all other inhumane, dehumanizing, and inhuman things continue to grow rampant in a toxic and all-around destructive form that stinks to the high heavens. Quetzal says it is frightening, how clearly and plainly you see the facts and the reality, my friend. I wouldn't like to be in your skin, as you tend to say, because you have to live on this earth among this humanity and fulfill your difficult task. If I just think of how you are still attacked and slandered for all your work and efforts, then I dread it. Moreover, I can't understand at all how you endure all this and remain undauntedly loyal to your mission, even though you would actually have every reason to refrain from it. Billy says Dear friend, I made a promise. Quetzal says that is well known to me and this word goes over everything for you. Billy says quite right. I can't break any given word. But let's leave this, for I have something else to ask recently, we talked about the primeval times of the earth, and the issue arose, which Semyaza also once talked about, that at least once on the earth, there had been a global glaciation, that is a total global ice age, which dates back about 600 million years. At the same time, the entire equatorial belt should have also been covered by many meters of thick ice and by enormous glaciers. This, along with the great ice ages and the small ice ages that repeatedly moved across the planet since ages ago and will also continue to do so in the future. Through the total glaciation of global expanse, the entire Earth became a giant ball of ice, that is an actual ice planet. In addition, I ask you since you are also a geologist and an expert in terms of the ice ages and so on, how the earth was able to turn into an ice planet at all and how the enormous masses of ice were able to melt and then disappear again. At the earliest times, the planet was, nevertheless, a giant glowing ball, before it solidified and formed actual land masses, on which then, in the end, Mountains raise themselves through inner earth movements and processes, etc. Quetzal says it corresponds to the truth that at early times on the earth, the ice regions and glaciers had advanced into the tropical zones and also forced the equatorial regions and even the entire planet under a mantle of ice that was many meters thick. Thus, the ice planet Earth actually existed, just as Semyaza explained to you. To your question of how the masses of ice melted again, I must explain the following normally, the Earth's surface is so strongly influenced by the Sun, through its rays, that the upper layer of the Earth is warmed up. However, this only happens under normal conditions and not with glaciers and large surfaces of ice, thus also not with small and great ice ages, because only the ice-free areas of the planet are affected and warmed up by the solar radiation, while the glaciers and other enormous white or bright greenish or bluish surfaces of ice too strongly reflect the sun's rays and, thus, also the heat energy. Consequently, they cannot melt by the solar heat. If large surfaces of ice and glaciers spread out across the planet through planetary climate changes or through disturbances of the revolution of the planet around the sun or through any cosmic influence then the Earth's surface naturally becomes brighter, by what means, as I explained, the sunlight, that is the solar radiation becomes much stronger than what is usually reflected. Through this, the planet takes in less and less solar heat as this was also the case at that time with the Earth and is the case with every small or great ice age. This is the reason why the planet's surface cools down more and more and why the masses of ice can collect around it, grow unrestrainedly, 
and expand.